Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Hello, good people. This is Chris welcoming you back to a fork in time. I'm joined here by Eric Rush. Uh, do you want to try and you know coin your own phrase or anything, Eric? Nah, I'm just here. Okay. Good cool. good to be here, always. Um, we, you know, we're we're keeping with our Sunday night recording schedule. Um, and I wish all of you have tomorrow off like I do for President's Day. Um, Eric and I were talking earlier and with Eric and I recording and it being right before President's Day, we're going to kill off a president. I mean, we knew that was coming. Um, Eric, who are we killing today? Uh, we are killing off George Washington early today. So go ahead and set up a little bit of, of Washington's background. And, and I, I don't think we need to talk that much about Washington and what he did, but that, that, yeah. that'll come out later. Yeah, we can talk about just a little bit about his medical history. We we actually have a pretty good history of for him, which which is not always the case. But um, you know, you know, Washington by reputation is a is is a pretty tough guy, and and I think that's true. I think Lena largely that's true. But he still had a lot of ailments, as was common during the time. Uh, what's interesting ab- about Washington is when he was a young man, he had several bouts of serious illness any of which could have potentially killed him but they didn't so when he was uh when he was 17 he had what sounds like malaria when he was 19 he was known to have smallpox uh and later that year he also had tuberculosis uh we think he probably caught t- tuberculosis in in barbados when he was there for for a period of time um and so that so he had a lot of things going on but you know that was probably not particularly unusual for the time uh, you know he was just uh you know he was a he was a young man in a in a foreign country and you know those kind of things do happen um so uh so he he had a lot of these ailments go go on um and he had a lot of, of gastrointestinal problems and there there's some thought that maybe these were related to um related to sequelae for his tuberculosis but we really don't know that uh for sure but suffice to say, he had a lot of illnesses going on, and yet that is not how we're going to kill him early. Um, we are going to assume that that Washington survives his his multiple bouts of of illness, and that he makes it to the Battle of Fort Necessity in 1754. And I'll turn it over to Chris for a description of Battle of Fort Necessity and what that means for Washington. So. Battle of Fort Necessity, if you're familiar with it from the American side, uh, is the beginning of the French and Indian War. But in talking to Eric, of course, also if I'm involved, it's going to be European. Um, This is the Seven Years War. So basically, this was one of those conflicts in Europe where everybody lines up against each other and starts shooting at each other. And that's why the French and Indian war really kind of happened in the United in our, in North America. Um, basically the French and the Amer and the American slash English are always fighting out there on the frontier. And it just so happens that this coincided with one of those general European conflagrations, which is why the French and the British and the Prussians and the Austrians and the Russians all get involved, all start shooting at each other, all at the same time, and that transfers over into basically the North American front. Um, But what Fort Necessity actually wound up being, uh, it is currently Pittsburgh. This was a fort built by George Washington as a Virginia colonial major, he was a major, I believe, right? He he had just been promoted to lieutenant colonel. Okay, um, which is which is interesting, uh, and and this is actually I'm glad you brought this up because I wanted to point out he was he was promoted to lieutenant colonel. He was 22 years old. 
he was very, very young. And, and that may have played into some of the events that did happen in, uh, in the Battle of Fort Necessity and certainly could happen in our fork. So in this time, in, in our timeline, he is promoted to lieutenant colonel, given command of an expedition out to really just re- reconnaissance, reconnoiter western Pennsylvania. Um, it is not British territory at this point. It's somewhat French, somewhat Iroquois turf. And his instructions are to go out and see what's going on and, if possible, expand British influence. He then proceeds to kill a French em- emissary, start a fight with the Iroquois of the area, and get himself surrounded in the one fort he builds, which is um, Fort Necessity, which is at the confluence. Uh, you know, I'm going to be 100% honest. My point of reference is it's at Three River Stadium. It's where Pittsburgh is today. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to talk a little bit, Eric, about um, what fort we discussed? Yeah, um, you know Washington being a being a soldier and being right in the thick of a number of things was shot at a number of times and and you know he he managed to you know escape in all, in those those cases but at the in the uh, in the the uh, the Battle of Fort Necessity he actually had his horse shot out from under him. And so what we're what our fork in time is 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 what if the bullet had just traveled up a couple of feet? Would that be have been enough to to result in in his death at the Battle of Fort Necessity? And again, he would have been a, a completely unknown young lieutenant colonel at that point, casualty of war. Um, there were, uh, in, in terms of the, of, of the, again, he was, he was in the colonial army. He was, he was, was British at this point. And that's something we don't think about, but there were, there were 30 British regulars that were killed. Another one would not have attracted much attention for some, for somebody that was, that was fairly nondescript. So we're presuming he, uh, that he was killed at that point. So. By the way, he lost that battle. He barely made it back to Virginia in our t- in in the actual in our timeline. He right? did, and he he was forced to surrender. Yeah, yeah, and you know he, he doesn't exactly have a stellar resume at this point. Not really. <laughs> um, and you know, so getting shot doesn't really help anything. Um, so. Carrying it forward, it doesn't affect anything for maybe the next 20 years. Right. Uh, the Seven Years' War in North America starts. It goes exactly the way it, it did in our timeline. Frankly, George Washington played no role, no significant role in the British colonial army right. after Fort Necessity. So fast forward, the British have to pay for this war. All of the taxes come in, the same thing that happened in our timeline. Because, again, if you look at American and colonial pressure, Amer- uh, revolutionary activity, he really plays no role right up until, I believe, 1775 and the Second Continental Congress. 1775 is exactly the, the year that I would I would put it at. Yeah. And then he starts to matter. and. And, and very quickly starts to matter a great deal. So just, you know, carry it forward a little bit. Um, he, he doesn't have a very good record. He he takes control of the Continental Army. He loses the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. He loses New York. He runs all the way to f- just outside of Philadelphia Valley Forge. And he's really, his main contribution is not losing <laughs> not losing the army basically yeah live to fight another day um so you know goes forward the french get involved he teams up with them he sees the opportunity at yorktown first president all these wonderful things go from there 
and eventually this war becomes too expensive to continue. Right. right. Um, but if he isn't around to show up in 1775 at the Continental Congress and put himself forward, we actually had some interesting ideas about how this happened. So yes, we did. He wasn't the first commander of the Continental Army. The first commander was Artemis Ward, who was a Massachusetts. He was from Massachusetts and was basically had a similar career. He fought in the Seven Years North American War. uh, And he took over command of the troops after the siege of Boston, after Bunker Hill and all of that. If there's not a clear. Um, you know, somebody standing there in a gorgeous military uniform. We think maybe at this point they let Ward or or somebody else stay in command of the Continental Army. Correct? Yeah, I mean potentially so. And with the uh, lacking a better option or perceived better option, at least in 1775. So 1775, the Colonial Army also tries to pull something off by taking Canada. And they send some troops up there led by a man by the name of Benedict Arnold, who almost wins at the Battle of Quebec, almost literally conquers all of Canada. Mm -hmm. So come, you know, fast forward to 1777, I believe, is Saratoga, right? And... I, I, the the other thing I will point out is mm-hmm. is General Ward uh, actually re, actually resigned in 1777 as well due to due to health issues. Okay. And and so you know the the and if we're so if we're if we're painting a picture, this is a picture that might actually line up in multiple ways. So so I Chris, <laughs> let's let's definitely dive into the into the Battle of Saratoga because that's that's going to be really important. But you know it may be a reason uh, for general ward to to step down as well because after losing in the battle of quebec uh arnold doesn't have a command he's kind of one of these generals that hangs around and isn't quite doing anything during the battle of saratoga until he starts doing things um who who's actually the original commander at saratoga on the american side i Remember, it was it was Gates, wasn't it? What 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 is what is Gates' nickname? Granny oh, Gates. To, what's that? I believe it was Granny Gates. Granny Gates, because he, <laughs> you know, is isn't exactly an active and aggressive commander. And no. during Saratoga, during the battle, you know, the colonial forces are attacking a. British force trying to come down the Hudson Valley, meet up with the troops already in New York, and cut off Massachusetts, cut off New England in the revolution. And Gates is engaging them, but he's not pushing it. And all of a sudden, as I understand it, Benedict Arnold jumps on a horse and charges right into the middle of this battle, right? Yeah. And he to some extent wins is is why we win at Saratoga, right? Well, right. And, and not only was Gates not aggressive, if, if memory serves, he actually wanted to retreat mm-hmm. at, um, it, at Saratoga. And it was, it was the, um, it was the field commanders. It was, and, and, and I can't remember all their, their names and ranks, but uh, you had Arnold and then you had, um, uh, Daniel Morgan and a couple mm-hmm. of others, and, um, who were who were the field commanders, who decided to take charge, and to to our to our benefit, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to say the least. It, especially because this is you know the first time that the British Army had actually been beaten. Yeah. Um, and very importantly, this is the excuse that France uses to enter the war. Right. Once France enters the war, this becomes a world war as well. You're going to see fighting in the Caribbean at some point. Both the Dutch Republic and the Spanish Empire get involved against Britain. And this is really what allows 
the American colonists to make this expensive enough to bring down the British Empire or to get the British Empire to decide this isn't worth it. Right. Right. So we're so we have um, we have Ward who stepped down in the spring of 1777. Mm -hmm. And then you have Arnold, who is showing his chops, you know, very prominently by the fall of 1777. So do we assume then that, that there is a little bit of a, we'll call it an interregnum where there maybe isn't, isn't a clear commander in chief, not really sure people are the continental Congress is sort of vacillating on who fills that role. And then all of a sudden it's the battle of Saratoga. And there's this one person, Benedict Arnold, who, and they, and, and they say, that's our guy. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we talked about this earlier. If you're an American, you you have a very different understanding of who Benedict Arnold is. Yes. Um, Benedict Arnold is almost the English word for Quislick, literally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but he's, you know, it's almost as if one of the reasons he does turn against the colonists in the end is because his ambitions have been foiled. He's he's a very ambitious man. It just so happens that they're married up to being a very talented man and he knows it. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I'm I'm reminded a little bit of some of the times we've talked about a MacArthur or somebody like that who's the most talented man in the room. It's just that he knows it and everybody else knows it as well. And there's he feels there's a resentment because of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and if you, and if you doubt it, just ask him. Yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of talked about the great man theory versus the, the, um, forces of history idea here. If there's ever a great man, most Americans will try and tell you it's George Washington. Yeah. I would but agree. the fun thing about what we've done here is the French are involved already. Yep. By the time he takes over. So the, you've the, got the die has been cast. We'll just say. Yeah. So you've got kind of the economic factors of this war coming into play now. Right. So how do you think it plays out with an Arnold in command? Well, I, you know, in all honesty, I think in, in many ways it plays out fairly similarly to to what it does in our in our timeline. You know, the once the French are involved. You know, the. <laughs> It really is sort of a bleed them white as much as possible. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's about not losing. You don't have to win. You never had to win, but you couldn't lose. Mm -hmm. And but part of not losing was to have some strategic victories, which they eventually had. And so by by 1777, as the French were were entering the war, now they they really only had to not lose. And to be able to outlast the the British, which they they did, and and so I would I would suggest that not a whole lot's different with that. Okay, but something's about to get very different. Okay, so let's play it out. And Yorktown happens the way it does in our timeline. The British sue for peace, and the nation starts looking for a chief executive. <laughs> yeah do you think I, I i think you and i both by the way this is the part that we did discuss off yeah, podcast we, so, no, so we're, we're, coming we're going in, we're into uncharted in yeah um i think as far as a military commander there there are lots of things that arnold could do that washington could do mm -hmm. and so i think he was i i do think he was a very talented military officer washington had political skills mm -hmm. that often are not appreciated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, anybody who gets in that role is going to have an ego. Like that is, that is just not going to be avoided. And so Washington too, but what Washington knew how to do, he knew how to check his ego. And that mm -hmm. was actually an important skill that he had is to be able to listen and to, and to come off as, a humble person 
And I actually think that Washington did not crave power the way some people do. I actually believe that that's true, that he did not crave power, which is, which really set our country off on a very interesting pathway. And until FDR did, and eventually until it was constitutionally you know, prohibited, you know, everybody by tradition limited themselves to two terms because Washington did. And, you know, and I, and I, I think about the, the, uh, and I was just saying in the Hamilton musical, the, the songs with King George the third are my favorite by far. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, George Washington's, you know, giving his, giving up power and stepping away. I didn't know that was something a person could do. <laughs> and so just the idea of giving up power and you had, it was seemed to be sort of somewhat of a foreign concept, but yet Washington did it now. Would, would somebody like Arnold do it? Absolutely not. No, no. <laughs> you know, even if you were to find himself in that role, and and I think that there were there were enough smart people in the room to know that this is not a guy you really want to give power to. Which was also, you know, in my opinion, one of the reasons why Hamilton got didn't get as much power is because you know we they people knew who craved it, um, and people knew the reasons why they craved it. So the question is this. You're you're saying that the Constitution is written so that the executive doesn't have that kind of power. Do you think the Constitution was written with Washington in mind, and we have kind of a Articles of Confederation that carries us forward? Or well, we we clear we start out with the same Articles of Confederation. Right. I, don't, I don't think that's right. impeded. But um, so the question is, how how much of the Constitution w- was made with Washington in mind? And. And some of it probably was. Mm-hmm. Is there somebody else that could take that mantle? It, w- it would not have been Arnold. I can tell you that much. It, it would not have been Arnold who could take that mantle and could be a, a consensus choice, basically, for mm-hmm. that everybody looks at it and says, okay, I'm comfortable with this um, when, when push comes to shove. Is there just, anybody else who could do that? Just from the Caesar perspective of people not trusting him? Yeah. But do you think we maybe have a constitutional one term? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, um, so b- because people are people fear, they didn't fear Washington in some ways. And so they just sort of let things happen you know, or, or they didn't. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and some people even wanted a monarch. They, mm-hmm. they, wanted, they wanted him to be king and he didn't want that. Right. Um, so, and, and, and I think, by the way. I do think um, Arnold, with his ego, would have wanted a kingship. I think, I think he would there's, have. there's definitely something to be said for, hey, listen, let's not trust this. You know, let's let's um, actually get this in writing. Yeah. And there's also something to be said that, listen, as a president, you don't want to be running for reelection because there's a natural temptation to use your powers to make sure you carry on. So in other countries, it's it's in their constitution. You you have one shot. You cannot be reelected. Right. So who who then who then could pull this together? Who would be that first person? I I still say it's a Arnold, but it's drawn up with him in mind. Okay. So that so that they're constitutionally it says you can be president you are president once you cannot run again so i have an an interesting idea uh-huh. and and i'm interested in, in what you think about this yeah so if if there's concern over limitation of power then you have somebody who is who has very consciously talked about about limiting power he was very consciously said you know we are we are not here to you know necessarily to upend the apple cart even though we sort of ended up doing it um but we were but you know p- balance of power is important representation of uh, of states is important what about william patterson talk a little bit more about him uh he's a judge mm-hmm. um the, he by and he was uh and he he had actually reminded the delegates um, that this is something that that they they needed to be very aware of what they were doing, um, and and he was a 
he was attorney general in New Jersey, as I th- as I think about it, and he and he did go to um, to to the 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 Philadelphia convention, and what and a couple things that he that were a little bit different that he wanted were things like a unicameral um, legislative body as opposed to the House and Senate the way we have now. So he had some interesting ideas that then didn't, didn't end up getting in there, but um, and he ended up being a federalist, mm-hmm. um, and so but but I, I do think he was very much a um, he very much favored uh, balance and fairness. And so I think he would be a person who, who could, um, who people would potentially trust if there's no Washington. Um, He was, um, he actually ended up being on the, on the Supreme court as I, as I remember, Mm -hmm. or at least he was nominated to the Supreme court. I can't remember. I think, but I think he was actually, I think he was on the Supreme court for a while. Um, So, you know, he was, he was clearly respected. Um, So that, that, that just comes to mind. Um, you know, somebody like a Madison um, was was too involved in the process, and, and quite frankly, too young. Um, he was only in his 30s at that point, um, so he so that that wouldn't have been a choice. Um, you know, people like Adams and Jefferson, they were mistrusted by enough people that they wouldn't have been a good choice for you know for the first president, even though they were second and third. But that's so, that's why you have the official written term limit yeah well and i and i think that could that could work so i think if i think if you have if people decide arnold's your guy they put some real boundaries on him Mm -hmm. and i think if it's something if it's more of a you know a consensus choice that that you know of a person that that people generally trust uh, then i think maybe you have something a little more like what we describe although you wonder if 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 he's a little more prominent if patterson's a little more more prominent um, do we end up with a unicameral? Does the Great Compromise happen? Never. Okay. You don't. You, uh, there's just I, no way it's going to happen. I just don't see a way in which all of those. You know, listen. It's it's designed. It, it, America has always had big states and small states, right? And you're never going to get Rhode Island and Connecticut to agree to Virginia and Pennsylvania and New York having all of the power. That's true. Well, and it's interesting, you know, considering, you know, Patterson was from New Jersey, which Mm -hmm. was not a, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a fairly densely populated state, but, but it's not a particularly large state when it, um, when it came to, you know, comparison to, you know, New York or, or Virginia at the time. And at this Uh, point, it's also geographically limited. Yes, absolutely. It's it's hemmed in. Virginia is not the Virginia of today. If no. you look at maps at this point, basically Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York just they extend all the way out. They don't all the really way out, have a western all the way border. out to the to the Mississippi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and even and and other states try to you know to get in on the action too. So you know when it, the the little section of of Ohio. Um, that um, includes Cleveland, as I recall, or at least mm-hmm. close to the, the section that includes Cleveland, was was uh, was designated for time as East Connecticut, or, or sorry, West Connecticut. So if you look on some maps, you'll find a West mm-hmm. Connecticut uh, on there. Yeah, Connecticut actually claimed a little part of that. Just just leapfrogging Pennsylvania. Yeah, that means the only way they could do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> but but so I you know I don't think you're ever I don't think you're gonna see. E- e- you're going to get a, a, a bicameral to get everyone on board. Everybody needs to have a say there. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think you would have a intentionally untrusted executive. Okay. Okay. Um, because this Patterson, who, what's he doing during the, who knows him during the war? Um, that is a really good question. Um, I mean, he, so I, I actually don't recall what he was doing in the war. Mm-hmm. I think he was, I mean, I think he was a, I think he was attorney general in New Jersey Okay. during the war. So he wasn't, he wasn't military. Right. And, and I think, and you know, that, that is, that is a big strike against him in a lot of ways, um, is that, you know, that he, that he wasn't, he didn't have any military service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. But so I, th- I think he was attorney general. Okay, but so he doesn't really have national prominence. No, 
no, not not at this, not at that point. The general is going to have the prominence. He and, he will, and, and there's and, no way that that um, he's not running. That Arnold is not trying to take this position. Oh, it, it, absolutely, with both hands if he can. It's just a matter of how much do people still trust him. And again, we're we're we we look at at, at we we're we're going to look at him, and I'm looking at him with John DeStive because we know who he was in our timeline. And he's not that person, but he's that person. I mean, he's still that person. I, he's still I, I don't that person. Think, I don't think there's any way that you or Jefferson, you know, Jefferson, Jefferson really didn't like executive power until it was his. Let's be honest about that. Well, that's just Jefferson, and yeah. and I and I, I will say I'm. <laughs> there are pre- there are certain presidents that that generally get high ratings that I'm not a fan of, and we and we've talked about Wilson. I'm not a big Wilson fan. Mm-hmm. I'm also not a big Jefferson fan. Okay, he was uh, he 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 fought really dirty mm-hmm. um, in ways that he didn't need to, in mm-hmm. my opinion. In no, I'm not a Jefferson fan. You know, so you think you just. Where you live should be French. If you think what now? You think where you live should be French? No, 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 no. It, 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 it's, it's very interesting how he's like the federal government should not have a role, should not have a role, should not have a role. As soon as he's president, federal government should have a role in everything. All sorts of things. Yeah. 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 And, and, well, and, and I will say, you know, obviously I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in the Louisiana person right. right now. So, um, you know, and again, and, my, and at, at, at the time of the Louisiana purchase, you know, my kid's family was in Kentucky. Yeah. But, um, but there's, but you know, it, it's, I'm sitting in Louisiana purchase. So obviously I, I, it's hard for me to not believe that it was a good idea. Um, but that's the, the other thing is Jefferson. It's, it's, um, it's hypocrisy. It's you know mm-hmm. decentralized power unless it's in my pocket, and then it's it's all me, baby. <laughs> so yeah, so I think it's a, he. You know, Jefferson very much would have been an early president, and you also he would have, this... he would have been. Mm-hmm. Would there have been an Adams if there's a if there's an Arnold? I think so. I think yeah. I think you have. At would he have some still point, been, he would still been vice president. You think? I I'm not even sure about that because yeah. where's Arnold from? Uh, Arnold's from Connecticut, I think. Okay, and and I think maybe honestly, Jefferson may be the second just trying to balance. Like I was just talking oh, about not, big not state, two, small state, two New Englanders on the on the ticket. Even right. yeah, uh, that's actually a really good point. I could Is, I can definitely see that. Well, if, if they could, so. <laughs> Then the question is: is is would they be able to rectify Jefferson's views with a Federalist view? Would that would that be enough? I mean, I mean, Arnold about, may not care. Well, remember, think about the earlier structure. It was the two top vote getters. Well, true. So I guess they don't have necessarily have to collaborate. Jefferson was Adams's vice president, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. So, yeah, it's not like they're running mates. Not, no, that's true. Not exactly. Um, but would would there would the Federalists run a Southern Federalist? Because everybody gets two votes, right? Isn't that the way it worked? I you thought vote, everybody... vote for president. No, for I president. thought that was, I mean, a, that was a change. Oh no, because it was, was just change. it was just first place was president, second place was. Right. I mean, uh, that was a constitutional a, amendment our, because of all of the trouble that. Jefferson right. well, Adams and, caused, which which has caused multiple other bouts of trouble over the past two hundred years. So, so you know, for like so for, first, for for anybody, the perfect check to a Benedict Arnold is going yeah. to be a Southern Democrat Republican. So or anti federal Federalist at this point. So Jefferson, in other words, it, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm I'm on, I'm on board with that, Chris. I, I think that's right. I think I think we have I think we have a Vice President Jefferson uh, very quickly. I actually wonder if they would have if Adams and Jefferson would would end up switching roles the, those initial roles with Adams as Secretary of State. I think that's a real possibility. I could I could definitely see that. And then, and then maybe again for the second, second, um, you know, that, that, uh, 1796 term. Well, or, or I mean, I guess it, it depends on 96. 
Assuming two terms, or if it's one term, no, it would be yeah, it would be nine. If it's one term, it was seventeen ninety two term. Mm -hmm. Then would they just would it would it just be the opposite of what it was in seventeen ninety six? Would it be President Jefferson, Vice President Adams? Mm -hmm. I think I, so. I think that that really could be because it'd be the you, Secretary of State very early on was very much the plumb position that put you in mm -hmm. you know put you in line for the presidency. To play out this out a little bit more, given what I've just been listening to and and I talked a little bit about. How does that affect the European, what goes on in Europe? Because you had Adams as viewed as somewhat of a Anglophile. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. yeah. Well, you, that, that would be interesting. It, <laughs> uh, so Adam, Adams is a bit of an Anglophile. And so how would that... I'm just thinking about a Jefferson presidency as of March 1793, right? Uh -huh. And so we we are in the depths of the French Revolution. Are we still in the directory? I'm trying to remember where we are in the French Revolution. 93 is like Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror. Part of the Reign oh, yeah. of Terror. So you've got the, you got the Reign of Terror. And you've literally got an American president who says that the Tree of Liberty needs to be watered from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. So so what does he do? <laughs> Is he just like Robespierre? You you go you go do it. I think he's I I think yeah, it's it's a very different American relationship with he revolutionary a... France. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because you know, hey, listen, you are the ones that helped us gain independence and now you don't have a mercantilist pro Britain trader. Right. You're a DER. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be very clear about that in this context. Yeah. As president, you've got freaking Jefferson. You got Jefferson. Who's <laughs> who's I mean who's probably gonna <laughs> let the let the French re revolution I mean I don't know we don't really have a lot of ability to intervene directly, but he, but he's certainly not going to interfere. Right. Right. <laughs> and you're not going to have these um, quasi war. Right. The way that Adams did. No, no, you won't. You definitely won't have that. I think there's, I think there's virtually no chance of that. So, but 1796. So again, we're, we're assuming the one term mm -hmm. 1796. Now you, now you do have Adams. Right. Which is actually catching us up to exactly where we are in our timeline, just in a different way. <laughs> in a, but it, it, in a really interesting way, you know, you you almost don't see. I guess you do have. Initially, we talked about Jackson. Mm -hmm. Um, for this episode, but you don't have strong two-term presidents between, like Washington and Lincoln, really. And Lincoln's a bit of a blip until you get to this century. Yeah, that's I mean, that's true. I mean, so you've got you've got the the first handful and then you've got mm -hmm. Je Jackson and then you've got Lincoln. That's mm -hmm. right. And so then but so take Jackson out of the equation. And so do you really have much more? Is, is it much more of a strong Congress? Or, I think you do have, you know, in in our. I, I think you have the kind of Congresses we we actually did have. The other interesting question would be. Well, and does that if, become sort of codified in, you know, it's in the constitution and then there's also traditions that build around it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have, and I think partly because it is, it is a, it is two terms. It is a fairly substantial amount of time. You know, there, right. there is, there is a lot of, of political philosophy around the, you know, the strong executive. And so, you know, we have developed a, a presidency in the United States that is, exceptionally powerful mm -hmm. and um but do we in this in this timeline is it much more of a prime minister sort of role is it out of that feel so kind of a henry clay as a prime minister yeah well and, <laughs> and he he would actually be a very natural choice i think i think yeah. he would i think he would fit the role quite nicely considering you know what he did mm -hmm. he was a legislator he was a compromiser i you know i think henry clay could have been very effective in the role Whereas I think, you know, I think somebody like a Jackson would have found the role intensely frustrating. I, um, maybe, maybe the, if it's Arnold as the prototype of it, 
that's just the elected commander in chief. Okay. So it they they are more of a they are almost a strictly military role and chief legislator so a so a, a, a ministerial role but also a military role. Right. But not right. N- but not the um not not the the strong executive that we would think now that that right. has you know has really uh, expansive powers. Or by the way, I think maybe it's possible that as time goes on and as society and politics change, maybe you see the powers of the president going the other direction constitutionally. Maybe you see constitutional amendments allowing for two terms. Yeah. Well, maybe you do over time, especially especially if we find that um, internal or, or external crises will uh, kind of necessitate a stronger executive. Right. You say we can't right. deal with this. Right. So, well, so Chris, I think I think this is this has proven to be a really interesting one that that is is a difference between a colonel being shot versus a horse being shot. Yeah. So I think this is a, this is a really good one, and we'll have to come back to the you know the the untimely demise of presidents uh, at a at a future podcast. <laughs> I mean, we're going to. We know. We're we all know to. that. Yeah. So just to wrap it up, um, I you know. By the way, we did have a question off podcast. If we have some of our Canadian listeners, this yeah. is a this is a topic we ask, and we'd love to hear from you. What was the name of the war that we say killed George Washington? Every American learned about it as the French. We all Indian. learned it in high in, in high school as the French and Indian War, but we here on a Fork of Time are calling it the Seven Years' War because uh, it was that's what it was it in was. Europe. Yeah, but. Is that what it's called in North America or just the U.S.? So we'd love to hear about that. We'd love to hear about anything. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> um, also check out uh, Discord. We are coming up on episode 200. We kind of want to plug a live stream. We're going to try and do another of those. Yep. Uh, we love to hear from people. We love to hear ideas. And uh, just closing it out, if you should come upon a fork in the woods, what should you do? I'd take it. All right. Talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.